custom, whether you're a semi-custom, whether you're a custom or you're high in luxury, Lutron is very focused on delivering solutions to builders to help you sell more homes, not sell technologies I heard earlier. Our value is in helping you sell more product and compete against the existing home market. So prior to you learning about the Game Changer panel, I'm going to talk a little bit about game-changing technology and put some of this in perspective. A little bit of an introduction to us. I, I'm assuming many of you know who we are. I'd like to kind of give you an update on where we're going and what we're focused on. Talk a little bit about the smart connected home market because I think it's an incredible profit opportunity to introduce innovations to your home buyers and to allow yourself to create differentiated value by applying some of these innovations. Talk a little bit about some of our solutions from the luxury down to the mid-market and really reinforce why we want you to think of Lutron first when it comes to precision control of electric light and daylight. First, you know, we're a privately held company. We've been in business for 55 years and we're, we are the leading global brand for the control or the precision control of electric light, daylight, temperature, both our own products and integration of other brands of thermostats and most recently, our brand being endorsed by Sonos as a very nice integrated product that includes control of music. So 55 years old, our claim to fame is that we invented the first electronic solid state dimmer in 1961. And today, the installed base of Lutron products saves over a billion dollars a year in electricity. Um, there you see the, the owners, uh, the late Joel Spira, who started the company, nuclear physicist from Purdue University really had a vision very early on about leadership and the control of electric light and daylight and providing lifestyle enhancement to homeowners as well as commercial customers because we do quite a bit of business on that side. And today the business is run by Mr. Spira's daughter, Susan Huckerainen, that you see there, and his wife is also serving uh, on the board. But we still have very solid family values and our first principle is to take care of the customer. Very, very committed to that. You can count on us for innovation, quality, and service. So, I know you've been listening to a lot of the speakers the last day and a half. I want to stress, the most important thing you need to embrace is to deliver lifestyle-enhancing benefits and solutions to your clients to enhance their lives, ultimately helping you sell more product. And it really is less about the technology and trying to sell customers on the technology and the products. It's really to deliver that experiential solution. And really, the key here is the smart home innovations that we're gonna talk about should deliver pleasance and lifestyle enhancement. And by the way, we think we kind of coined the definition of pleasance, but to Lutron, and I think you can relate to this, pleasance is a fundamental feeling that's hard to describe but that people desire to experience. You think about that. You know, to me that relates to some of the challenges and opportunities. A lot of what you're here to learn about over the next day and a half are solutions that nobody knew they wanted or needed, but once they had them, they'd never give them up. And the thing that I always think about is the car today. Whether we go to the 27 Hyundai dealership, 2017, dealership uh, for a new car or a high-end BMW or Mercedes, the technology in those cars are going to be virtually identical and people are never going to give them up because every car they have, there's more technology and they understand why they have it. Most importantly, the auto industry is not giving those innovations away. They're built into the price of the car. And my message to you is you can sell innovation and technology into homes and profit by it and differentiate your finished product. So I've used this slide before. There's really, this, the news is the same. The connected home market, the smart home market is expected to be over 122 billion by 2020. And really this is about profit and growth through innovation. And I know you'll hear more about that in the panel discussion. We focus on three primary areas. Simple and reliable smart home technology that enhances homeowner lifestyle across automated shading, lighting control, and even high-performance LED fixtures. Lutron is a leader in LED driver technology and fixture technology because there's been so much infusion of LED lamp and lighting and driver sources. When it comes to control, there's all, often problems in finger pointing on projects and by having 
high performance fixtures, we can kind of take responsibility for that issue. When I talk about our business platforms, I know in this room there are luxury builders, there are semi-custom builders, there are high volume builders, there are also architects and designers. We have solutions for every market segment. The flagship for our brand is HomeWorks QS. It's a high-end home control and automation system. We can control up to 10,000 devices. It can be wired or wireless. In fact, Lutron invented the first two-way RF wireless lighting control back in 1997 called ClearConnect. We still use it today, and we believe for our products it's the best-in-class technology to reliably control lighting and shading, although any other protocols that you choose to use are Z-Wave, Zigbee, Wi-Fi. We integrate beautifully with any other protocol. And the message I want to give you, always pick the best-in-class brands that interoperate well together. And don't confuse your customers about protocols. Sell them on interoperable systems that work reliably. That's the most important thing. In the medium, medium side of the market, we have a product called Radio Raw 2. It can do up to 200 devices. It's really designed for the high-end semi-custom home, five, 6,000, 7,000 square feet, very scalable, very integratable, and is a great value in terms of ease of retrofit for existing homes, as well as design into new homes. The most important innovation that Lutron's introduced over the last couple years is Caseta Wireless. This product is a simple, affordable, and reliable solution for up to 50 devices for mid-market homes of 2,500 to 3,000 square feet the ability to control electric light, daylight, temperature, integrate with voice and music, very simple setup. This is really a game changer in terms of delivering reliable, life-enhancing connected home experiences to homeowners. And most importantly, and I'm going to get to it again in a minute, it installs just like an on-off switch. And it's set up using a simple smartphone, whether it be Android or Apple. And if you know how to buy a smartphone and download an app, you and your homeowners and installers can be expert in setting up an initial system as well as adding more devices. So I focus on this product because it's really the entry level into smart and connected home. And here you can see the universe of products that works with it, but everything from our battery powered shades to Apple, Siri, and HomeKit to Nest, Carrier, um, Hunter fans, voice recognition, which I'm sure you're hearing about, is a, the fastest growing control element in the home, and I think it's playing a big role. And of course, things like Sonos and, and applying music. So uh, the other thing I want to say is this product can also integrate upward to major control brands like Savant, Control4, Crestron, URC. So we as a brand want to be kind of like Switzerland. We want to deliver the best-in-class products and solutions, but we want them to be able to interoperate with other best-in-class brands, including companies that we sometimes compete with in certain segments. But at the end of the day, we want to deliver the best user experience and for the builders, deliver re reliable products that will mitigate your risk so that you can promote and specify our brand with confidence. Really, my big message is the switch is obsolete. Game-changing technology actually has been around for a while. It started with the solid state dimmer, but today I call it the connected home ready device. So switch to Caseta devices, uh, wireless three ways, drive incredible opportunities to sell technology into homes. And then the other side of it, you know, the manual shade is somewhat obsolete. We now offer battery powered shades with up to five year battery life, shades that can be up to 12 feet wide and 12 feet tall. And these are simply retrofitable and specifiable. And everything I'm showing you here really is on the simple, affordable, and reliable spectrum. If you look at that little graph at, at the bottom, it's all about what we call potentiality. You know, there's 114 million existing homes out there. There's clearly over a million new ones being built. But if you just look at the potential to sell innovation into a space, and you realize that the average home is 22 on-off switches and about 25 windows, selling technology and innovation into the homeowner to enhance their lifestyle is a win-win opportunity for everybody in this room. Finally, I just wanted to say our difference. Obviously, we have 55 years of experience. We are the leader in the control of electric light and daylight. We have the most reliable RF. The key things are 24-7 technical support and a ton of resources to support your needs, corporately, regionally, and locally. 
Uh, so with that, I want to thank you. We do have a booth, number 1101. You can't miss us when you walk inside the trade show. I appreciate the opportunity to tell you a little bit about our brand, and I would like to bring John Galenti up from AE Ventures to introduce the panel. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm back <laughs> with a great panel here for our Game Changers uh, luncheon presentation. Um, just moving left to right here. David Pedigo is the VP of Emerging Technologies for Cedia, the Custom Electronic Design and Installation Association, really the leading association in the country, in the world, for the companies that do um, integration of electronic systems in homes. To Dave's left is Gordon Van Zyden, who is the owner of Cyber Manor, which is a San Francisco area based integration company that's been on the forefront, especially um, of, with advanced digital and IT based technologies in uh, home control and the connected home. Next to him is Terry Wardell, who's the owner of Wardell Homes, which is a Uber luxury builder here in California. Semi Uber? Semi Uber? Uber's it. <laughs> Uber's probably not a good choice. <laughs> <laughs> Uber's lost I'll, the I'll connotation I'll it used to have. Right? I'll stay with that. <laughs> luxury home builder in California. And then Jacob Atala, who's um, with KB Homes, has been for a long time their leader on technology um, application. His title right now is VP of Sustainability, but he's embraced the entire tech yeah. ecosystem over the years. So a great panel. Our um, Goal for today is to introduce uh, game-changing game technologies, products, and applications, stuff that's either here right now and just starting to make a difference or on the horizon. Um, and we're really gonna kick it off with a, um, an establishing presentation from Dave. Gordon's gonna dive in a little bit on the uh, voice control piece in particular, and then we'll have a lively uh, panel discussion um, to, to dig in deeper. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Dave. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. And first of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak to all of you. Um, I really appreciate it. There's uh, so much for us to talk about. I, it's uh, really difficult to condense it down to uh, 15 minutes. In fact, I've got four 45-minute presentations next uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, and I don't even think that's enough. So. Um, so we'll just talk about a couple of things that we're seeing that are coming up in the next year to two years as real kind of high level topics to talk about and then we can kind of discuss through them. So if you see at the top there, it says CDA Tech Council. The CDA Technology Council is a council of CDA volunteers. It's really the people with the big brains that are kind of figuring out what are the emerging trends, opportunities, and threats to the industry. Gordon happens to be our chair. And uh, so last year we, we were in Amsterdam and we talked about, well, let's come up with about 100 predictions to where we think things are going in 2020. And then so a couple weeks ago, or last week, was it last week? Something Two weeks, I, I can't tell. Um, we were in San Antonio and we, we can condense things down. And so here are a few things that we think are worthy of paying attention to. First of all is cybersecurity and privacy. Um, does anyone know what the, uh, if you look at the picture on there, the angel right there, that is a weeping angel. Are any of you familiar with what the term weeping angel is? You all need to, oh, one in the back. <laughs> okay, just one of you. Weeping angel is the, uh, the code word for the CIA hacking into Samsung televisions and uh, turning on the microphone and the camera to see what's going on uh, while somebody's in there without uh, it looking like the TV is on. So 
With that, that's actually a perimeter kind of issue. They had to actually break in first, use a USB and put it on there. But at the end of the day, what's going on is that we're really starting to see that there are potential security and pr privacy issues in regards to technology. <clears throat> um, and as Gordon will talk in a little bit with voice control, I think there's a lot of there's huge opportunity for voice control. I'm incredibly, incredibly optimistic about voice control. But at the same time, there's things that we worry about in regards to um, privacy. So make sure that you don't conflate privacy and cybersecurity either. They're two separate things. And so let's look at them kind of in two different parts. With cybersecurity, that is a national issue. Um, how many of you have heard about the Dyn attack, D-Y-N, uh, in New Hampshire in October that took out about 25% of the U.S. internet. That was done uh, with approximately 500,000 IP-enabled or network-connected cameras and um, a combination of passwords on your router. So most people change the SSID, the actual name of your router and your password. But what you don't do is you don't change the IP address and you don't change the administrator username and password. In fact, the overwhelming majority of all routers these days have, have a combination of 16 usernames or passwords. And so because of that, it took down 25% uh, of the entire uh, US internet through what's called DDoS, which is distributed denial of service. The bottom line is, is that because it's a national security issue, because that can affect us economically, uh, take down power grids, those kind of things. It's likely that we're gonna see that there will be government intervention in order to get uh, consumers to secure their products better. Uh, they'll force the manufacturers, they'll do education on the consumers, but the bottom line is, is that home technology professionals really know how to do it properly. Um, the other thing is, is in privacy, and so the privacy side of things is, is that anything that can be hacked will be hacked. Privacy is down to your personal level, making sure that whether it's uh, unfortunately naked pictures that you have on a server or your front door lock is hacked or those kind of things, um, th there's lots of considerations. The problem is, is that everybody wants to get products out to market really quickly and they don't pay attention to what can I do to keep this secure. So um, we all feel that there's going to ultimately be a trade-off between future functionality and privacy. Okay, how many of you at least have some semblance of worry over cybersecurity issues or privacy issues uh, with your products? Some of you, okay. All right, so now something more fun. <laughs> more fun, audio and video. Uh, how many of you have a home theater? Oh, my. come on, people, you need to have a home theater. Define it. Yeah. Okay, well, define a home theater. Uh, that's really difficult, actually. So how I would define a home theater would be a dedicated movie room that you would actually watch. Um, here, I'm going to go back for a second. That you would watch uh, and not do anything else in. And the media room would be a room that is, uh, has a nice TV, nice stereo system, like the DeViolet De speaker that's over there. Um, and maybe has a pool table, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. TV is going to get so much better. Um, this, let me go back and see if it'll start over. This video right here, you see this is a video wall called Cletus, which is a crystal LED. It's 32 and a half feet wide by 10 feet tall. And um, you'll see me walking with it. I took this video with my iPhone. And it's absolutely stunning. It's just a tile. So basically, at some point, especially for the luxury <coughs> side of things, you're gonna start to see entire walls that are just a display. And so one of the things that you could think about, I'm really excited about, I had actually thought about this years ago, was to take a camera, so here's a concrete wall, put a video display on it, have a camera that's going out that way in a DVR, and it actually makes it look like you have no wall and that you're just looking out there. And then the beauty of it is, is if the weather is crappy, you just hit the yesterday button, and now it's sunny again, and you're looking through. Is, is the weather ever bad in Indianapolis? Oh, it's hideous in Indianapolis. 
So, well, I don't know, I'm never there these days. So there's a couple other things in regards to televisions that we should pay attention to. Uh, 4K, meh, but 4K added with HDR. How many of you have heard of high dynamic range? High dynamic range, if you look on your, for you iPhone users, you have an HDR button on the top of your camera. And what it does is it just gives you a better contrast ratio. And so TVs that are coming out today are gonna have significantly better contrast ratios. Um, we're gonna see flexible displays. So displays where you'll wrap them around walls, those kind of things. We'll have better audio. So um, uh, I love that speaker, by the way. So, um, but other, other kind of audio, immersive audio, speakers where we have up to 32 speakers in a room. And you think, well, why do I want 32 speakers in a room? Well, for us technology guys, of course you want more speakers in your room because that means we get to sell you more speakers. <laughs> but no, the real reason is, is because then we can actually uh, make it sound like in real nature and get it not just around this way, but a whole envelope, a whole dome that goes around you. Um, so there's lots of opportunities for audio. And then ATSC 3.0, how many of you um, have stopped subscribing to um, a cable or satellite provider? It's called over the top, okay? ATSC 3.0 is a new standard for, for video broadcasters. The, the local broadcast companies are gonna start broadcasting 4K and it's gonna be IP enabled. There's a whole bunch of opportunities. You don't have to really know about how the technology works if you're builders. Just know that there's a lot more 4K content coming, and it'll actually be free. But so, you need an antenna. You need an antenna. So uh, it's time to go back and get an antenna. A Wagi or a Yagi. Yeah, it, however you want it. Indoor, outdoor, it doesn't matter. The beauty of off -door, or outdoor antennas these days is it's either perfect or it's not there at all. So um, one thing to note for the, um, for the integrators here is you really truly have to pay attention to HDMI 2.1. So because we're going to better color, we're going to higher frame rates, and we're going to higher resolutions, uh, that TV that you saw uh, a couple slides ago, the big wall TV is using 8K, and to put it into layman's terms, a, a regular uh, HD image is equivalent to a two megapixel image. So the phone on your camera takes a significantly better picture than your HD TV is able to provide. A 4K is, depending on the aspect ratio, roughly nine megapixels, uh, between eight and nine, and an 8K will be 32 megapixels, or 32 million pixels. Because there's so many pixels that are actually going on in the screen at one point in time, it requires an incredible amount of data to go back and forth. Well, so for the builders, as an example, what does this mean? What it really means is we hear all the time that I don't have to run wires because it's all wireless these days. And I promise you this, it is not all wireless, okay? In regards to the best wireless networks right now, you're getting maybe one gigabit per second, and the new HDMI formats Right now, that's out on the market is 18 gigabits per second, and the new standard announced in January is 48 gigabits per second, but really they're talking about 72 gigabits per second. Well, then the question is, is well, how do I prepare? Well, there's two ways to future-proof a home. One is to, to pull fiber, because fiber has those speeds, but the better solution, especially for builders, is to make sure that conduit is pulled so that when new standards come out, we can really put the new kind of cables in without causing harm to the home. And then so uh, the last thing I'd talk about is content. And content is really changing relatively quickly. So I just saw this yesterday. Uh, you know, some people in the room said that they've cut their cable bills or, or satellite bills and are going over the top. For the first time in history, or at least uh, since the cable companies were out, we have matched or equaled the number of cable company subscribers and satellite subscribers to those just using off-air and streaming services. So what that means is that more and more customers are going to demand 
that they don't pay for cable bills, which frees up more money to put in nice flooring and cabinets and those kind of things. Thank you. Um, but at the same time, you have to have a good quality, reliable service. In order to do that, you're gonna need an antenna, you're gonna need conduit, and you're gonna need a network that is robust enough to be able to handle the large amount of traffic that's going through. So <clears throat> for you integrators here at Integrated Systems Europe in Amsterdam last month, we really saw it, and I think Gordon, you'd probably agree with me, the kind of the first inklings that the HDMI matrix switch is probably not gonna be around much longer as we truly start moving video and audio content over IP and not do it over HDMI and just have the copyright protection built in. Um, uh, content services will be driven, well content will be driven by services and services will drive the content. What that really means is this, is that content is king. It, how many of you watched The Walking Dead? Oh man, it's a boring <laughs> crowd here. You gotta watch more zombie movies. Uh, how about Game of Thrones? Okay, so Game of Thrones. HBO is making hundreds of millions of dollars on Game of Thrones because they understand that content is what's so valuable. So Apple actually is likely going to be buying a, whether it's a Hollywood studio or creating their own content because they realize that all the money is in content. Or AMC, who is incredibly valuable now because they created their own content and that's gonna drive where things go. And so, um, uh, we have all these services, Sling, uh, Google just announced YouTube TV, which will be a, a direct competitor with Direct TV. It'll be a direct competitor with Dish Network. Uh, so we'll have all these kind of services come out. And ultimately, the last thing is, is that physical media is going to hang on by a thread. Uh, vinyl's making resurgence. Uh, we know that people like to listen to analog. Uh, they like to listen to records, but when it comes to, let's say, uh, Ultra HD Blu-ray, uh, it's really kind of up in the air right now as to whether or not Ultra HD Blu-ray is gonna take off because streaming services are so good. I can honestly say, uh, I, I watch a, a good amount of movies at home, I cannot tell you the last time I actually physically bought a disc. And so with that, Gordon, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you, thank you David. So uh, again, thank John Galante for uh, inviting me to come on stage. This is my first time uh, to be at Tech Home X, and it's an honor to be really, it's enjoyable to be in front of a crowd. I typically am in front of a lot of custom integrators at CD and other events, so I learn just as much from these events as, as, as I do by talking. So uh, just to hear the issues that come up in both the uh, production and custom builder environment is, is very helpful for me to understand. Uh, we ourselves, Cyber Manor is a company that I founded about 20 years ago in uh, Los Gatos, Cal California. We're in the San Francisco Bay Area, kind of in the heart of the, the Silicon Valley community. And the company was really born from my IT background. i just give you a little bit of background because I think it kind of helps position all the various technologies in the home, control, and then as we move into voice, because they all come back still from a, a core set of roots. Uh, and in this case, my roots were in the IT space, and it was all about, uh, back in the mid to late 90s, that the corporate environment was very engaged in the network is the computer, uh, or the computer is the network, and the whole concept is that the integration of many computers and many services, files and prints, really made a much richer environment in the enterprise world, all connected to a high-speed internet line that went to the enterprise. And the productivity and the gains were tremendously enhanced by that, by that network. Forward to about 1999, 2000 in the SF Bay Area, Comcast was beginning to roll out for the first time an always on cable modem service to replace AOL, the dial up. And I'm sure a number of you in the audience had that kind of AOL dial up experience. That transformed what was then being a, what you could offer in the home in the sense that no longer was it a serial wait for somebody to get off the computer and the next person can get on and a kind of a one person, one computer experience. It now became always on, email is always available, content was always available, files could be shared, printers could be shared, and the beginning of the home network, even before Linksys and, and uh, Netgear and the like, was in that 99, 2000 era when 
the first connected system in the home appeared as a result of this high-speed internet connection. We'll fast forward to today. You now layer onto that all of the various digital platforms that make the network so critical in the home. You layer on audio in, in, on the network, and Sonos has been mentioned a lot, one of the first kind of network-based um, audio systems. Kaleidoscape uh, was one of the first kind of network-based video distribution systems. Control 4 became one of the very first IP-based control manufacturing companies. And so they all rode kind of that curve to make that network common language infrastructure more and more uh, valuable to the homeowner. And at the end of the day, where we were left was trying to figure out, okay, we have now at least a common backplane of services in the home, but the key will really be how do we align the consumer, our client, that comes in all shapes and sizes, and we heard Tim Costello talk about you know, the nerds and the aspirational ones and all the various different segments that we serve. But for all of those segments, one thing's very clear, uh, and I think Shelley Palmer, when he did his keynote at CD a few years ago, probably said it best, is we have to really do the best we can to eliminate the friction between somebody wanting to do something in their home with technology and something happening. Whether that want is comfort related, it's entertainment related, it's security related, we've all had kind of this backlash of experience that I couldn't operate the lighting, the music, the TV, and as a result, we just fall back to what we always know. And so the ability to create interfaces that make that as seamless as possible becomes almost paramount for what we do in, our, in the custom integration space for anybody to enjoy any of the products that we put in their home. So I put this slide up. This is you know, representative of the homes, just I would say pre, you know, pre the iPad, we solved a lot of the problems on the left side with many different remotes and different wall devices and different keypads. In the, you know, the, the late 1900s and the 2000s with devices from Crestron and AMX and others because there was no really mass market and app based touchscreen. And it was clear that if you at least had a graphical interface and you had soft buttons, you probably could do a lot more to provide universal control than all of these individual interfaces in the home. But the, the market really got kick-started. I'd say the introduction of the iPhone, and especially with the iPad in 2010, kind of revolutionized what people could now do inside the home in the sense that they already had a device they were very familiar with was the phone in their pocket, and now they had a rich graphical interface that they could touch to engage their lighting, to engage their music, to engage entertainment. And it really became a catapult for us and for a lot of our clients to say, this is really the bridge between wanting to do something and something actually happening inside the house. So it, I think in many ways it became the beginning of really what was the connected home, and I know there's a lot of different terms for that, but it really was items that were on a network that were now connected, that universally were accessed by a Wi-Fi device in your hand, and became a good experience for opening garage doors, for changing the temperature, for turning television sets on. But, uh, I think what caught a lot of people by surprise was that as good as this interface was, something really much better for a lot of usage cases was right around the corner. And while I've been playing with voice for like so many of these technologies for a long period of time, what I think caught a lot of manufacturers by surprise by its prevalence and the acceptance that Amazon has now had in selling some 10,000 Echoes, I think, uh, over the course of the last couple of years, and now have some 10,000 10 plus. 10 million. 10 million, excuse me, 10 million echoes over the last few years and some 10,000 plus skill sets is that the critical threshold I think was passed in the last few years was that voice recognition moved from a 95% capability to a 99% plus capability. So now the ability to at least talk to something and for that something to really understand what we said without having to repeat it many times now became more and more of a seamless issue. And you couple that with the fact what I would call Amazon now really developed what I call talk to talk. You know, it's one thing if we still have to grab a device that has to be in our hand, we have to find it, has to be charged, and we push something to talk, which was kind of the conventional way. That's much more of a restriction to that interface with the device trying to control than if we just talk naturally to it. So I think, you know, now this wonderful ability that this woman, you know, Alexa's voice, and there's other voice solutions, Google and Josh and a number of others, is just there in the room to listen to the things that we want while we are engaged doing something else. And I think that was 
those couple of things were really dramatic. And it suddenly opened up an opportunity to say, you know, all these things that we've put in the house, the comfort, the security, uh, the entertainment, which we benefited from these graphical devices, but how much richer could it be if I could just walk into the house and that scene that I have to craft and I have to go to a screen, but I just say, I'm home. And I, I'm home starts to bring all of these elements together of a connected house to a smart home. I home means, you know, open the gate, turn the lights on, play some music on. And the wonderful part of voice, at least from us in the custom integration space, is that for our clients, we've already created the, the platform is there. And one of the great benefits, if you can apply technology, I think, in a wise way, is to do it in such a way that you put something in and you don't have to take it out every couple of years. Uh, and the beauty of what the technology platform that we've now adopted is one where it's all in the network, and whether it's Control 4 or Crestron in this particular case, then all of those elements, provided the network is robust and those things are working well, it's truly just an inexpensive add-on to suddenly add on that Echo device or a Google device if they have compatibility with it, and just to engage voice. So, so you now have basically taken clients who maybe weren't using certain devices because they just didn't, even the Sonos' interface, as good as it is, just didn't interface really well with Sonos, will now leverage voice and will say, have music play in the master bedroom, whatever source it is. And what's happening behind the scenes is that request is being made in our case to Control 4, and then Control 4 has a driver for Sonos, and then Sonos starts to play in the room. Ultimately, Lutron and many other manufacturers actually have direct skill sets that will talk directly to these various devices so you can also engage them with these direct skill sets. But the, the bottom line of all of that is that we now have the, the, the framework in place to enable this more seamless approach uh, to using voice inside the house. Uh, but I also want to make it clear that voice is not, uh, like, and I think Tim brought it up well in his talk, is like so many of these things, there are promises of technology, and then there are some other things you've got to consider, I say drawbacks, but you've got to set the stage properly for the proper usage. And I put this here because in the process of kind of creating this frictionless home, there are a lot of other devices that when we, as integrators, well engineer, we create the right interface for the right room for the right person. And there's lots of places where having a wall keypad and a switch is the right thing to do. I think it'll be a long time before we take light switches in any other formats from dimmers or keypads off the wall to what just becomes a, a voice <coughs> activation or some other activation. So those are still very handy to have as they are for up and down volume controls in a room. We'll still do touch screens because you're not gonna sit there in the middle of somebody watching the movie or somebody trying to read a book and it's a quiet environment and start yelling out to Alexa or Google or to Josh or whoever it is about doing something. So there are gonna be touch screens in this space. Um, handheld remote controllers when you sit in front of a TV set and you're having a TV experience, you're still gonna need a universal remote for that experience. Voice control, we've talked about that's part of the mix. Gesture control, I, I saw, uh, I think it was uh, Legrand actually did a demo on one of the earlier sessions that I said. They have a, a gesture control based interface as you walk in the room and you just kind of wave your hand and it may be up and down volume or change channel or whatever. Fibro is another Z-Wave based company that's doing things like that. And I think we have to be aware of how gesture has a, has a place in the house. Even something as simple as buttons. Uh, I've been playing around with Logitech and their, their pop button, which is essentially just a simple button and you program it, you hit it and Sonos music plays in a room or a recirculating pump turns on, what have you. It's probably the ultimate simple interface because it's just a button. And then even far down the road is thought control. So we bring all those things together uh, and we show them, speaking to, again, Tim's comment, we put those together in our experience center home. So much of this stuff is really, not only is it better educated the consumer by having it in a real world and home platform, but we learn from it by doing that. So we leverage the home that we have in Los Gatos with those platforms to show our clients. We do it also on our website and you kind of see and feel how these technologies work within the house. In terms of where voice is today, uh, I think we have to be careful in how we position it. It's easy enough to layer on to what's already being done inside the house, but there's some limitations. Uh, the limitations are still that the, the language and the, and the lexicon that you have to use have to be very, very specific to what Alexa can understand. It can understand your words, but it typically has to be said in a certain sequence. 
So that will only get better over time, but right now that sequence can be somewhat primitive. Personalization, just knowing that it's you that's talking and you want certain things versus somebody else in the house and voice recognition capabilities. But those are all things that are being worked on. Location awareness, why should I tell Alexa or whatever uh, product it is, if I'm talking to the Echo in the master bedroom, that I have to invoke a particular action and say master bedroom. But that's all coming. Local caching, it becomes really, really important that the latency of these things, like all control devices, has to be very, very low. Nobody wants to wait even fractions of a millisecond for something to happen and, and keep pressing a button for something to happen. So the ability to have this dialogue between the device and an action to occur has to be as fast as, as possible, and caching will help that. And then lastly, artificial intelligence also becomes part of the, the personalization part of this. So the, to we, we did this, it, we had the good fortune that Amazon came to us in the early part of last year, and a gentleman named Pat Hagerman, who was here yesterday working for Domotes now, is actually working for Cyber Manor, and they asked us to see if we could help uh, Brookfield Homes on the East Coast develop essentially their model home to kind of showcase what voice could do, and I think uh, my, uh, and I wasn't directly involved in the product, but my understanding was it wasn't so much that they said, okay, this is gonna be the be all end all, and this is what we're gonna do for all the homes. We at Brookfield wanna showcase that we're a leader in innovation, that the glow from leading in innovation makes people better understand that we're home builders that want to participate in what we think is gonna be a very valuable addition to the home. So they uh, brought us on board to help do some of the, the initial design work, we work with them, and then Jonathan Stovall, I think, is in the back in the audience as well. Energy Squad and their group actually did the infrastructure implementation uh, of the model home, and it showcased Lutron shades, or uh, it's, it showcased motorized shades, showcased Lutron lighting control, so showcased Sonos music system, showcased control four, and in fact, they had, I don't know if you've kind of seen that slide, placards as you'd walk around the house, which asked the uh, client to say, you know, play a given scene, show a certain play certain music, turn on the TV, play movie time, play Star Wars and the like. So they actually kind of coached people through that house to really create a, uh, a vision of what could be done with, uh, with voice. Hey Gordon, so, does, doesn't Alexa do some of the selling in the house too? Not just yeah. selling the technology features, but selling some of the other options and amenities, kind of to right. Mike Moore's point, right. salespeople might be automated out of things. Thanks for teeing that up. That was it. So exact. So the, the the breadth and beauty of that platform was that not only did it have to be used for home control, but they could leverage it through some information, and, and a client could say, "Tell me a little bit about Brookfield Homes. Tell me about what's going on inside this given room." Uh, so they could actually coach it and actually became kind of an agent assistant, so to speak, uh, for the house. So those were some of the ways they leveraged. They had a, a big touch screen uh, that also gave some information about it. I think what's key to also understand here was that there's two parts also to this, the, the market from our perspective. And one is, you know, we tend to work with smaller cu custom home builders that work on a smaller scale, maybe do a dozen homes, and we do a lot, a lot of high-end concierge type of service for them. But as you move into the production environment, you have to find a way to provide these smart home products at a much more affordable price point, both in terms of the, the product themselves and the, and the service and support. And that's really, I think, where, where Jonathan and his group at Energy Squad have come in, and I think they're here in the booth uh, downstairs, to showcase that they really have some kind of entry-level solutions where you can put in some of these IoT devices with voice control, and most importantly, provide a level of service and support to those clients on the back end so that when issues come up, they have a way to provide an affordable way of, of service and support. So in that sense, you know, we're trying to, to leverage this particular tool across both the high-end CI channel and something for the production builders. So, uh, so we're really enthusiastic about it. It, it kind of, it's a shot in the arm for us. Uh, it's a way to engage people in the technology that they have been using in their house, and it just becomes even richer. A reason maybe they all have more lighting control or more motorized window treatments or a smart sprinkler system because now it's all controlled by voice. So with that, uh, and we'll just kind of close. Do they have that video? They're, we have a little video, actually, that the Brookfield people There's did. a very active culture of innovation in our company. Oh. It's in our DNA. Uh, I think you have the wrong video. It allows us to not <laughs> the accept wrong video. what is anyway, the status quo. Anyway, we'll cut it because we'll I ran long. Anyway. There's a video that they mentioned with uh, what they did with Alexa, and it's really positions that, well, not only they kind of describe what they're now doing for various scenes, 
but it's all about imagine what it could be. Imagine where we can go with this. And I kind of leave you with a thought that that imagination, what's happened today, is that the hardware is kind of given it as a certain level of, of proficiency and feature sets, but the imagination is through the software enrichment that we're now doing. Every week, Alexa will tell you by email, this is what Alexa can now do that it didn't do last week. Hmm. And that's what it's doing. It's taking that platform, and every week, Alexa and Google and others are enhancing the experience for the client, all things that they didn't have to pay for, all that come week by week, because it's now a software-enhanced tool. So if you want to see the video, uh, maybe Jonathan has it. It's on our website at cybernet.com. You can link through it. Uh, for those builders who are thinking, how do we best leverage this, I would argue that it's not so much just for the technology. Look at it as marketing. Uh, from what I saw, the Brookfield Home uh, Project got picked up by a bunch of the local news stations, a bunch of the newspapers, and the like, all who picked up and leveraged it, and, and I think brought a lot of traffic to that site. So I've gone over, but uh, in any case, that's our perspective on voice. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. you don't need, need the clicker. Okay. Okay. So we're going to we'll turn to our builder panelists now and just get some reactions from them on what they heard from the integrators. These, these guys are close to the cutting edge of technology. Does it, did you hear anything there that you think your home buyers, Terry, your luxury well, home buyers um, would be interested in? I need to make a distinction here. I'm a, a custom builder. Uh, we do some speculative work, but primarily it's contract work, right? So uh, clients come to us with a design team, architect, uh, all of that. Um, more than likely they don't have an integrator, but more than likely they have a lot of experience with this stuff. It's not their first luxury home usually, right? Mm -hmm. So um, my view as a builder is that this is a, um, uh, I need to be aware of the technology and I really enjoy hearing where it's going. Um, I build um, homes, I don't build houses, right? And I, I create experience for my clients from the very first meeting to when our repair and maintenance department is in the house five years later just helping them, right? It's, it's all an experience at that level of, of clientele. Um, as a builder, we need to know what's available and we need to be able to advise. And frankly, when you get to that level of, of uh, depth, we need to know which integrator is going to work best with that client, which is a whole nother <coughs> personality issue beyond just technology, right? Um, it has more to do with home than it has to do with house. I mean, this is really what it gets down to. I have clients that um, had a Crestron system in their house 15 years ago and have come to us to build, you know, we didn't do their original and they don't want any technology in their house because of their experience. And every integrator I know knows those clients. You've got to treat them completely differently than the client that comes in that's in his, uh, he and she are in their early 30s, they've made a ton of money on the deck and they want to have a ton of fun with the house. That's a whole nother experience of client, right? So to me, technology is important to be able to make that client's vision of a home real. Mm -hmm. I frankly don't care what my vision of their home should be in that regard. I really don't. I, there's products I absolutely love. I, Sonos, I've had it in my house for years, you know? I replaced my earlier audio system, you know? Uh, but if a client wants Sonos or they want something else, I'm, I'm totally supportive. All I want is for them to feel comfortable with the process and comfortable then with the home. You can build a fabulous home. If the client has a very, very rough um, time with you, they will never love their home. You can build a home and just you know, do a decent job. Have your client like the experience, which has to do with the integrator you put them with and the plumber you put them with, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they will love that home and you'll have nothing but solid referrals. Mm -hmm. So my advice to builders is I think it's great to know and be aware of what's coming down the pike. Um, you need to be able to talk intelligently about it with your clients. Um, but it isn't the be all end all. I, mean, I know it's a tech conference, but um, it's really about how do you create home and how does technology help you and help your client, most of all, um, realize their dream of home. That, that's really what it's about. Well, and so uh, first of all, I think you're absolutely right, 100%. Um, 
And so one of the things that I think is really important is um, that we should stress to all builders is, is that whatever, first of all, you should develop a relationship with uh, an, an integration firm mm -hmm. it, it, that you create a, a long-term partnership with. And then the other thing is, is I think it's incredibly important to have the integrator uh, come in uh, early on in the discussions to figure out what they want. So, but, you know, you think about a movie theater as an example. You, mm -hmm. If you want a home theater in your house, the, the dimensions of the room are as, mo as much or more important than the quality of the speakers. Because if you build a room that uh, the dimensions make you have all sorts of different uh, resonance problems, those kind of things, you're going to have a problem. So uh, you're right. And then the other thing is, is that the formula should always be for an integrator. Reliability first, easy to use second, then cool and fun. So, oh, and, and that is the correct order. And the ability to to listen to to the builder's client, and the ability to respond after they've listened, uh, and to truly deliver. And you're completely correct. I, I'm a big believer in putting team together before you ever break ground. Um, I, I I wouldn't want to start a house without the HVAC being determined uh, as as much as the tech, and frankly, the tie-in between the HVAC and the tech. I mean. The, 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 a whole nother set of, of, we all know as builders, there's a, a few thousand issues you're gonna deal with before you break ground on any given house, uh, and you need to be aware of it. Yeah. So, Terry, I think what we've heard from other luxury custom builders at previous conferences is sometimes they have confidence in that integrator from a technical perspective, but they don't have confidence in them in terms of the customer interface on the front end in the set, this process, the selling process, really doing good discovery and mm -hmm. needs analysis. Has, has, has that been the area where you, you've seen struggle? Um, yes. Um, quite often, integrators are great at uh, tech detail and just a stone wall to um, human interaction. I mean, we, we've all experienced this. Um, I, and that's why a builder has to know the lingo builder has to understand where it's going, and sometimes you do have to interface. Um, I mean, heck, uh, have a Title Twenty Four in California consultant talk to your client. <laughs> I mean, I, that's we were talking about that earlier. I mean, you, that, you you might have to have it happen, but my God, you, you better be ready to explain everything the guy just said because your client's not going to understand a word of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the stuff you were going through, I'd say. 40 to 60% of my clients would have been lost about a minute and a half in. Just would have been, which is perfectly fine. I think you would have been aware they were lost and you would have retailed it for them. Mm -hmm. Some people don't, right? Jacob, let's get some uh, feedback from you. What's your reaction to the technologies and products you heard about? Terry's lucky. He has it made. He can interact for a good period of time with the customer um, before he starts building the home. In many cases, a production, high volume production home builder has to bid the projects before we ever see a first customer. And so we are um, forced into being curators. We need to know what's the best technology to use and uh, offer to the customer when they come through the door, when it is um, uh, technologies that could be standard and also technologies that are uh, an upgrade and uh, an enhancement uh, that they may order. Um, I liken this to sort of the Snickers uh, uh, candy bar company, uh, how they are there to curate the best chocolate, the best nougat, the best peanuts, and then as far as um, what else goes on the bar or how it gets wrapped, that's truly up to the customer or up to the season. You know, at Christmas season, they put a different wrapper than Easter and, and the Valentine's Day and so on. We're the same thing. We need to be the curators of the best of breed. Um, and that's been changing over time. We'll, I'll get to it in a minute. But best of breed, always do your best to curate the, uh, uh, you know, the best of breed, the simpler, uh, the robust, and the secure, as we heard uh, uh, today. Curate that, make it part of your standard or foundational uh, um, 
elements that you put in the house, whether it is the thermostat, the door locks, the light switches, dimmers, um, and, and um, <clears throat> other things. And then maybe there are options. Uh, room fans, if they are an option, well, be again with the best of breed and make sure that it works with everything uh, else and works with uh, as much of the popular brands out there, whether it is Amazon Echo or Apple HomeKit or anything else out there, make sure that your foundational works with all these because it's really up to the customer. We cannot tell them, uh, no, you gotta use uh, uh, A or B brands uh, as far as that final layer. Um, so that's the first thing we have to be, our, uh, is to be a curator. Understand the business really well to be able to be pick the best of breed. And I think uh, uh, conferences like this really gives us that opportunity to understand the better products out there. Um, now, just want to go back to, um, uh, uh, you know, things like, for example, where we've been and where we're at. Um, I've known Gordon since the I for uh, uh, the control for uh, days and uh, uh, been with you. Maybe this is the fourth or uh, fifth conference that we do together. The iPhone, it's a decade old. It rocked our world. And we started well, uh, with there is an app for that. And then I have to work with the app and kind of make things happen. Where we're heading now is we're heading to the smart home that is aware and does things for you. It is uh, in the back end, there is big data, there is artificial intelligence, and until it starts reading my uh, stream of thought, there is voice command for, for me to tell it what I'm thinking about uh, right now. So we're he heading to, towards an aware home. The smart home will be an aware home. To me, also, a smart home is a home that is sustainable, and that's part of why, uh, as a vice president of sustainability, we have smart systems and smart technologies as part of sustainability. Um, but uh, security and best of breed work together. I'm really glad that you started with, the, with, the, with, the, with that uh, early on. Where, where are you on, on voice control? And researching and curating that specific technology? Are you so guys we're really leaving it to the customer. We do have great relations with um, uh, Apple. We have been one of uh, uh, two, uh, uh, three, three builders that rolled it out in the country uh, last year. And, uh, but we also have relations and talk with uh, Amazon and others. Right. So one of the things I'm, I'm curious about, and maybe it's more on the the, the luxury build or not is, I find that the biggest opportunity for voice control is going to be for people who have uh, specific uh, disabilities or limitations. Yeah. Uh, as an example, so my father who uh, lives with me has uh, in, you know, chronic kidney failure, lots of issues, and so we got him voice control and I, I just had him use it for 60 days. So middle of the night he'd get up, say turn the lights on, go back to bed, turn the lights off, after 60 days, I took it back from him. He goes, well, how much is it? And I said, $200. And he's like, eh, I don't want to pay for that. Four hours later, he called me up and said, uh, I can't live without it. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. so uh, for him, it was, it was kind of a life changer. And so I think that voice control will certainly help people. Uh, and it's not just voice control, AI, those kind of things. So I'm really excited about where we go with digital health and and uh, people with uh, disabilities, and are, are you thinking about those kind of things? Or? Certainly. Um, uh, universal design is the big name that we mm -hmm. put uh, behind this. And there, there is a great story that uh, um, we can tell from Lutron with, uh, uh, you know, Lutron works, why we like Lutron, for example, as uh, just uh, one company to pick on, is that they work with Amazon, they work with Apple, they work with other systems as well. And uh, uh, there was uh, a person that's handicapped when, when you paired Lutron system with all the things that it does plus the uh, voice uh, control system, it was very much an enabling uh, experience. Uh, can I, I just touch on a couple points that both of you made. Uh, the best of breed terminology is kind of near and dear to kind of our philosophy as well. I think you know we have to always keep aware of our market and our audience 
uh, versus the much larger players, the, as we heard, the Best Buys, the Lowe's, and the, and the rest. And we have to select then a best of breed that caters to our higher end demographic audience. So when we showcase these home solutions in our experience center, we're gonna showcase the entire home solution, whether the Lutron homework type lighting system or a full Sonos audio system or maybe a high end camera system for robotics with the idea that we know that Target has their open house right up the street from us in San Francisco. And they're targeting that open house, which is also an experience type of center but around more single type of room solutions. And they're typically more, these are the sub two, $300 products that the masses will tend to bring, bring in and, and, and deploy for themselves. So we have to make sure that our best of breed caters to our client base, mm -hmm. and that's best showcased through things like our experience center. So, and, and we find it incumbent, not only do we have to give them that touch and feel and experience, but to kind of your point, we have to get them past the I had the horrible, oh, the yeah. affluent clients who have had a poor experience with technology in the past is a very, very common scenario. Mm -hmm. And it's a case of gotta be careful about not throwing the baby out with the bathwater because for that same client, if you say, well, would you like to be able to turn the heater on before you get home from your app? Or would you like to be able to watch this streaming content that you otherwise couldn't get? Would you like this? When you start educating and say, there is content, there are services, there are things you can do that you couldn't do before. As, as long as when they're interacting with you, yeah. they're actually believing you yeah. so, because and, they've been snowed before. I get it. And this, so the right. seeing is a That's big important. part of the believing. Oh, yeah. And then the other part of it that I would say is our role now more than ever is not just to put a wonderful system in the, in the house and then they move in and we're done. I, if there's any one last thing I could leave on any relationship that we have with any builder, is that we're perhaps the only trade that should be a lifelong partnership with mm -hmm. the owner and with the builder. Mm -hmm. Because everything that we do at the moment that they move in will be changing within months or years shortly there. Oh, uh, and our relationship, yeah. so our relationship right. is only as good as, oh, as, yeah. as that ongoing. No, our, uh, we, we have a repair and maintenance department for that exact reason. Right. We maintain relationships with our clients for right. years as well as it generates more work as well from other clients coming in. But um, the R&M department has solid relationships with the integrators that did the work in the houses. And we work with a very few integrators. I think it's, as builders, it's crucial that you find good integrator to work with or integrators to work with, you know, depending on your business model. But it, it's absolutely crucial. And that's, yeah. that's uh, true for custom or even yep. for production. We built 10,000 last, you know, last year, close to 10,000 homes. Um, and uh, we just, uh, across the country, we have six uh, integrator partners that we work with. Some of them work with us at multiple states. Um, I think that relation, uh, relationship is very important, the long term um, and, and the understanding of the business. Yeah. But what I would say with that is just, sorry. Go ahead. Is the one thing is, is that, so the integrator that you have a partnership with, let's say that you're a builder that does both custom and does some production, the integrator that you're doing work with that is a high-end, high-custom, doesn't do a lot of volume, is probably going to be a different integrator than you do that is more experienced in high volume just because the, the, the business sure. processes are a little different. So Well, and the product The product, the product offerings, different. yeah, the yeah, product lines. Well, I mean, the, when, the, like, voice is real exciting right now. Um, I don't think we've put voice into a single house yet. Um, uh, and it's because the integrator's gonna need to be completely comfortable that voice will work in the large home format and it will work with that kind of a, a client that, that, let's face it, higher end clients tend to be a little bit more difficult to deal with at times. I mean, they, they have a, a bit wider life experience and, and ex, a higher expectation level. And integrators typically, uh, to your remark, uh, higher uh, end integrators don't wanna put in systems that they don't feel rock solid about because they'll lose their shirt on a follow-up phone call yep there right. there is a not to pitch any companies but yeah. there are high-end oh. there is a high-end voice control company and i think we'll probably see more that come into the oh, market I, I think it's very shortly in coming yeah but uh, and uh, we had the discussion earlier right there's a um a slew of um low market items that are sold through you know lows and those kinds of things and um uh 
I, I think a lot of that integrate, uh, innovation is going to be happening at the market end as opposed to the luxury end. I, I, you know, I think previously it filtered from the top down. I think we're starting to see where it's going to filter from the bottom up for a little while. I mean, that, that, that wave changes, but it seems like that to me, the number of IP devices I find at the, at the hardware store. Um, I mean, we've been doing electric door lock, you know, card reader proximity. We did proximity reader systems 30 years ago that, you know, turned on the house. And you, in those days, you had to have a whole lot of analog switches to make that happen. I mean, we've been doing all that forever. But I, I think that the um, consumer market, which is where Alexa and those kind of things are really starting their drive, is going to be bringing a lot of that change. And that's going to create the expectation level in the luxury buyer. And that's when they're going to start asking for that. But happening and, now. and there's Quick no point. question yeah. that, like in almost any technology that we set, that we talk about with and consult with the buyer, is to set the proper expectations. Yep. And voice is probably as good a place to start as any. It's still kind of in its alpha phase. A lot of people have, do it, have a wonderful time with it for setting egg timers and telling me what my calendar is going to be. Uh, but you know, when Lutron steps up to the plate and says, now we're integrating with a homework system and I can turn on all my backyard landscape lights, which used to be five switches around the house, with a simple command that says, turn on backyard oh, lights. Yeah. Then you start to then, piece by piece, mm -hmm. see the benefit. On the same token, before, in this case, Amazon recognized there was a spatial distance between echo units, and you could start getting interference across echoes. In a large house, it doesn't work very well if there's interference from hearing these various things. That's been addressed. But at the same time, if you talk to it and you have to say it three or four different ways to finally get it right, and it isn't right, we're not quite there yet. So this is all about realizing where we are, yep. setting the expectation, and knowing that some things it can do exceptionally well, and some things, there's a reason, you know, when Amazon went from whatever, a dozen developers three years ago to 3,000 developers, this is a game that's going to be played in a and a major battle. It could field. easily be the new and, iPhone. Yeah, so, so it, it, it is incumbent going to be on the new us iPhone. to be aware of exactly where it stands. It, it yeah. will be the new iPhone. Yeah. It, and, it, and, and it is the most revolutionary product in my mind, so I look at things as evolutionary or revolutionary. Mm -hmm. the, the, the revolutionary products, iPhone slash iPad, next one is the Amazon Echo. The one thing I will say for all of you, though, is, is pay attention to some of the stuff that's coming out there that's also junk. Not everything needs an internet connection. I saw an internet connected <laughs> hair dryer to tell you, I, I think it was telling you like, you know, you're drying your hair too much, you know, your ends are gonna get burnt or whatever. Yeah. Uh, we don't need that crap. That work yeah. for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well. yeah, no, no, no. So, so it's back, back for a minute to the best of breed. I just wanna mention, and this is uh, something that Mike uh, uh, earlier today uh, uh, positioned very well. What is best of breed for a builder? I mean, it has to take in everything that you're talking about, including the UI, but it also has to be that it does not add to cycle time. It does not add uh, 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 too much cost. For example, uh, Lutron going from the high market to coming to the mid market, that was an absolutely wonderful decision. Um, and it's, it's about security. I want to go back to security. Uh, being also that we're a public builder, we're concerned about what we're putting in our homes for the home buyers and who's going to get hacked. Uh, so security is very important. That's and that's what Apple does really well. The security yep. layer for Apple is absolutely the best that I've seen. Um, uh, but but it's it is these things and it is the continual advancements as we continue with uh, UI. We have not seen the end of UI, and I oh, you know, no. I love the, your your story mm -hmm. about the email that uh, Alexa customers get every month. That's fantastic. Great, great counterpoint, folks. I really, it's been a really interesting discussion, and unfortunately, we're about out of time. The exhibits are going to open at 1.30, so let's thank all of the panelists for all of the information and perspective they provided. I want to thank David Weinstein and Lutron for their sponsorship of this session. David, way to go. And before I let you loose, this is the last time we'll be together as a group, because from here on out, you've got your one-on-one -on -one meetings and boardrooms. A couple of housekeeping things. Um, one is for all of our guests. So if you, if you like this event format, you need to understand that it relies on the sponsoring companies um, getting 
you know, reliable fulfillment of what they're expecting in terms of the one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, at the scheduled time and attendance at these boardroom presentations. So that's, that's the way we're able to host you all here and provide you a program like this and your, your hotel accommodations and for Northern Californians, your flight. So please be respectful of those obligations because they're key to this event working for everybody, okay? So that's uh, one small housekeeping piece I wanted to communicate. Number two, we will be back in 2018 in uh, Pasadena at the Pasadena Convention Center. We're gonna be sized about the same way that we are here, uh, hopefully some more sponsors, but about the same size um, audience. And uh, we'll have a little more of a compact schedule that's more in alignment with our traditional hosted only events that I think you know, everyone will feel better about that flow as well. So um, I wanted to let you know that. And I wanna thank everybody on the guest side who, who came out, who invested the time. I wanna thank all of our speakers and our sponsors for participating in this event. Hopefully some of this magic that we anticipated of getting design build and tech integration and contracting all together in one room and everybody looking at our opportunities and the requirements for success is some of that magic is starting to happen and some of the relationships that will bring that idea forward are starting to happen as well. So really do appreciate your uh, participation. Thank you again and um, we'll see you on the show floor and in, in your various meetings and boardrooms. Thank you.